Hi, and welcome to the Spooky Isles. My name's David Saunderson, and today we're talking to actor Robert Lloyd Parry. How are you, Rob? Good, thank you. Uh, we're, we're talking to you today. Uh, we've known you for a long while. We uh, we had some articles from you back in 2012. I've just looked, uh, and that was about Mr. James. And uh, what I found interesting uh, at the moment is a lot of people uh, what they're doing to keep themselves busy, especially when uh, we can't get out into the world. You're putting a lot of your uh, performances online. Tell tell us a little bit about what you're doing with uh, that. The, the the classic ghost stories that you're uh, showing to us. Yeah, well, so the, the, the way that I've, I've performed Mr. James for, in fact, the last 15 years is, is me sitting in an armchair um, with a glass of whiskey at my side, my candlelight, telling the stories directly to the audience. And that fits itself very, very comfortably into using Skype or, or using live streaming on, on Facebook or YouTube. So I've really, I've, I've been kind of going through my back catalogue of performances, bringing them live um, Sundays, Wednesdays and Friday nights. Um, on, well, first of all, Facebook, now on YouTube. Um, and as well as the M.R. James performances, I'm doing rehearsed readings of, of other kind of genre classics by H.G. Wells and Arthur Macken and Sheridan Leffin, who did last night, did the, um, the uh, Green Tea by Sheridan Leffin. So a lot, of very, a lot of interesting stuff that our Spooky Isles uh, readers and uh, viewers would be very interested in. Would you sort of maybe go back a bit and, and talk about how did you uh, start to do these? I'll call them immersive because I feel like when you're watching your performances, it is like you're sitting in the room with, say, Mr. James, the way he used to do it yeah. you know, back at university with the sort of the college students would come in and he would tell them the yeah. stories. You're, you're doing well, it very like that. This is, people often say this. They say he told them to his students. They weren't students. He didn't really okay. have students. He, he wasn't a, a kind of teacher, a university teacher in the way we think of today. He was a, a researcher and an administrator, and he'd tell them to his colleagues. You know, people, they were men the same age as him, usually. Um, yeah. There are some stories. There's one story he did write for the, um, the choir school at King's College. But on the whole, his audience were, were grown-ups like him. Oh, so um, you didn't have, to, didn't have to deal with the, uh, that kind of, you know, having to deal with students type thing. It was a much nicer I, I way. He did much. I mean, I think, he, you know, he's very genial towards the students. But he, he wasn't really a teacher in the way that we might think of a university don today um but yes how did i start well yeah i mean the first time i ever did it was really immersive because the, the first venue i ever did it in was mr james's old office in the fitzwilliam museum in cambridge um i used to work at the fitzwilliam and, um it was while i was working there that i discovered mr james had been the director in the years leading up to world war one and um i kind of just talking one day with one of the curators you know in the in the kitchen I said, you know, wouldn't it be nice to do a performance of one of his stories in, it's called the Founders Library. It's this magnificent Victorian library, just sort of full of wooden bookshelves with leather bound books, floor to ceiling, wonderful fireplace, huge mirror. And so the first time I ever did it was Christmas 2005, December 2005, stood in front of this fireplace. Um, and yeah, you can fit about 35 people in there. So even though he wouldn't have probably told the stories in that room himself, was very much at the time of year and in the, the context in which he, he would have kind of written the stories as well, I think. I mean, the first story I did was Canon Albert Stratford, which has in his basis this uh, idea of researching medieval manuscripts, which was M.R. James's great um, scholastic achievement. Um, and he'd have done all that work in that very room when I first performed that. So there was, there was for me, um, and I think the audience, there was a kind of immersive thrill about doing it in a so closely connected with them. Um, and yes, since then, I, I've tried to imply uh, with my set and with the candlelight and the, the kind of room and evening in which he would originally have read his stories with okay. his friends. Well, what we might do is just, uh, we'll show one of your clips, yeah. uh, Casting of the Runes, which, mm -hmm. uh, which became quite famous as uh, Night of the Demon, but in the style that you've talked about, uh, under the you know the dark with the candlelight, with the the squaff and the whiskey, uh, we'll we'll just play it now, and then uh, maybe you come back and tell us a little bit about that uh, cast in the runes. Hmm. Hmm. He, he was in a a somewhat pensive state of mind. That 
Dunning passed into the manuscripts reading room of the British Museum and had collected the books that he was then consulting. He was just arranging them on his usual desk when he thought he heard someone whisper his name behind him. So he, he turned round rather hurriedly. And as he did so, he accidentally knocked down the little portfolio in which he kept his notepapers onto the floor. Now, well, there, there was no one that he recognised, so he, he picked up the portfolio and was just settling down to work when the gentleman seated at the table behind him tapped him on his shoulder. Might I give you this, sir? I think it should be yours. I mean, it was one of the quires of scribbling paper on which he made his transcriptions. It must have fallen out of the portfolio. Oh, thank you. Yes, that, that is mine. I, I'm much obliged. Please. Well, the, the, the gentleman left the reading room shortly after that, and, and Dunning was just settling down to his studies, and the museum attendant passed his desk, so he... He beckoned him over. Yeah, the, Terence, yeah, the, 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 the gentleman that, that was sitting there just now, in, in the seat behind me, uh, stout chaps, uh, sideburns, uh, think he was carrying a Homburg. Ah, uh, oh, Mr Carswell. What? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, it's funny, he was asking after you the other day. Yeah, he, he wanted to know who the, the great experts in the land were on alchemy. I, I said, Mr Edward Dunning's the only man for you. Did you, Terence? Thank you very much. Yes, in fact, shall I go and get him, sir? I, I think he wanted to talk to you. No. No, no I, thank you, Terence, but I, I don't think that would be a good idea. No, no, not right now. Oh, all right, sir. You know, I have heard it can be a bit odd, but he's always been nice enough to me. Still, he, he doesn't come in here very often. I, I doubt that you'll run into him by accident. Now. More than once, on his way home at night, Dunning had to reflect that he, you know, he did not look forward with his usual cheerfulness to a solitary evening. Okay. <laughs> That, that was fantastic. Then that's just a small part of it. So obviously we're going to be able to see uh, more of your work. Tell us a little bit about you know what you what you do to prepare for these performances. Uh, well, kind of when I'm working on them, I kind of the, the first thing I do is is kind of a uh, uh, download the story. I kind of I tend to repunctuate it first of all, edit it slightly, because um, even though he did write them to read aloud, and even though they do have a kind of oral anecdotal quality to them. Um, sometimes I, I kind of edit them a bit to fit my own mouth in. And in fact, with Casting the Runes, um, which opens with, with quite a long scene with several characters, I, I have rationalised that a bit. Um, so yeah, I kind of edit the story um, to varying degrees. Uh, and then I divide it into small chunks, you know, two, three hundred word chunks, learn them vaguely. And it's a very, very boring and time consuming mm -hmm. project. Over the space of about three months, I build up the story. I, I, I learn the story. Um, and, you know, learning and rehearsing are all done at the same time, really. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's absorbing the story is done over the space of about three months. Then I perform it for however many years people want to. So, do you find any of any? Was there any particular story that you you felt had a a better flow to it that you that you enjoy more than others? Well, I think I think all the ones I do, I've I've kind of uh, I've I've found that the flow of them, perhaps even in some cases, imposed a flow upon them. Um, there's one story called the Residence at Whitminster, which I, I I do greatly admire, but the the stories he wrote it, I don't think would work very well out loud. It's it's kind of lots of you know half of it is um. Is uh, extracts from a, a, a girl's diary and so on, and it's written in a deliberately kind of archaic language, which I don't think would work yeah. in the way that I perform them. Um, but yeah, so there are some that kind of require less intervention on my part than others. Um, and perhaps the earlier ones are those. So, Can an Albrecht Scrapbook, the Mezzotint, I think I've adapted very little indeed, but some of the later ones, like Casting the Runes, Presence of Witness, a little more streamlining. Why do you think we're still listening, listening, reading, and well, I say enjoying? I suppose that's just to answer the question. Mr. James, Mr. James worked so long after he he passed. Well, you know, because they are uh, they are thrilling. I mean, you know, this is the thing. They're very well written. He he had a natural um, 
storyteller's gift. You, you get the impression that he didn't labour over these stories. He, he wasn't a you know a, a kind of a professional writer in that respect. He kind of I, th I think you know he had the idea. He wrote it down. You can almost tell this looking at his his um manuscripts of his work, some of which still survive. You know, it's not full of kind of redrafts and so on. He um so he had he had a natural gift for storytelling. Um. And also, I mean, they're terribly interesting. He, he just had a, a unique set of uh, kind of knowledge. Um, and I, I spoke earlier about his work with medieval manuscripts, his, his profound knowledge of the kind of more, uh, less brightly lit areas of medieval history and iconography and so on inform his mm. work. He, he manages to communicate this very interesting stuff, as well as, you know, being able to, Raise the, the goosebumps um, as well as anyone else has ever mm. done. I think. Uh, uh, do you have any? I mean, uh, has there been any works you've not been able to do of his just because it's inaccessible? Or, I mean, you you, you spoken before about that one that was written in the the young girls sort of yeah. you know thing. Is yeah, there well, anything else that you know we have, you've not I been able to do? By him, I mean, I, I think I've done most of what I consider the the masterpieces by him. But there's one that I've never quite got to grips with, which is um. Mr. Humphrey's Inheritance, which is actually very long, and it contains this brilliantly done um, pastiche of a, I think it's an 18th century sermon, um, which is you know, very metaphorical about the maze and the image of the human soul and so on. Um, it, it's a pure piece of writing. I, I've never quite convinced myself that it would work out loud, but it's the kind of thing that I will go back to. And how long do the, uh, I mean, you, you know the more, but they all seem to be within a reasonable sitting distance, and they because they are short stories. So, yeah. would this would that one have been too long to do? Uh, do you think? Or I, yeah, I, I don't. I can't remember off the top of my head how long it is. I mean, you know, uh, again, the the context in which they were created to read out loud to friends that was effectively a Christmas party. A lot of yeah. it on Christmas Eve. Uh, so, you know, he didn't want to bore his audience either, and he he does have a again, it's a natural instinct, I think, for right length, and they all last about. 35, 40, perhaps 45 minute tops. Um, and I think, you know, I've discovered as a, as a live performer, um, particularly if you've only got one voice talking to you, um, that's 45 minutes is really the, the upper limit. Without and, you've, and you've got to pay attention too, because there's things that are insinuated a lot. And, you know, well, if, you, if you're not, if you're not paying important. attention, you miss the point of the whole, the whole story. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very yeah. Very, you know, he's a very subtle writer. What did you think of the BBC versions that uh, were in the seventies and even pop up along nowadays? Yeah. Well, I, 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 you know, um, I think some of them are very good. Um, some are better than others. I, I think the, um, I think the best one for me, and I know not, not everyone admires it, is the um, "Oh, Wish and I'll Come to You," directed by Thomas Miller. Yeah, it's genuinely. I can't think of any, or very few other bits of television that are genuinely scary. That really. Yeah. That really is scary. Um, I think it's beautifully made, superbly acted. Michael Ford. And, you know, even though it play, it, it, it isn't perhaps as loyal to um, the, the source material as some of those others from the 70s are, it, um, it, I think in spirit, it actually gets the story absolutely right. Um, but there are other good ones as well. You know, the Lost Hearts is another one. That's a... Yeah. That, that's creepy just watching it, isn't it? It's kind of almost got a kind of comic edge to it, that. It's, it's got yes. a kind of 70s campiness to it, I think. It is, but it's... Which I like. What is, is it like? That? I think it's that, isn't it? Whatever the kids yeah. are doing, yeah. The oh, hands, yeah. Yeah, so it's very, very creepy. But you, you obviously don't just focus on MR James. That might have been the way you sort of came into this. But you, yeah. you said before you were doing uh, uh, H.G. Wells and Sharon and the Fanu, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, and other uh, ones. What, what, what would you like to do next that you haven't done? Uh, well, so, this is... A bit different with me. So, in fact, you know, that th this being able to do the the other stories online as rehearsed readings, a it means I don't have to spend that three month period I talked about committing them to memory. That's um, true. And so it kind of gives me a chance to experiment slightly. The problem I have as a live performer is I, I the other kind of big show that I've taken on tour was yeah. a an adaptation of The Time Machine by H. G. Wells, um, and I was very pleased with it. And you know. People came to see it and were very appreciative. 
but in certain places it was a real struggle to get an audience at all some places are spent to very small houses and i've noticed that even with this live stream stuff the amar james stuff gets a pretty decent audience each night but you see green tea by sharon lefany at which i i labored quite hard to, to adapt it yeah I had a very very small uptake last night and you know maybe a few more will kind of watch it on, on catch up and so on but the worry about doing other authors well or even other genres is is whether they, it's enough to attract an audience i was surprised that hg wells was not the draw that i thought he would be my name alone whereas mr james you know at least say it's classic ghost stories and you know mr james is not a household name i'm often surprised by how how many people haven't heard of him you know i've, I've met people who've studied English literature university haven't even heard of him however there's a, a small passionate minority who have heard of him and, um who will hear nothing said against him so um I've kind of built up an audience of the Amar James and I'm a little shy now about um about you know, working heavily on a new show but I've got other authors lined up um Conan Doyle I'd love to do some Sherlock Holmes yes. um and Saki now Saki is yes. the, I've done Saki as rehearsed readings live in pubs and so on, and it works superbly. Um, and I think I will do a, a kind of more developed Saki show at one point. But I do worry rather whether public at large care. Yeah, I mean, Mr. James. I mean, you, you're right. It's probably it's, it's sort of a funny thing. Like when you talk about Christmas and in our you know our sort of world, spooky owls and yourself, Mr. James is as much Christmas as Santa Claus type thing. You know, it's well, it's, you what, know, it's yeah. what it's what it's what it's what you expect here, but uh, but uh, but people do know it because it's on Christmas each year and stuff like that. So yeah, so you're sort of sticking with what what works well, and, what, know, and what and what people want. Yeah. So in, in, well, in fact, sorry, I, I, I should have said now, um, I this month and for the next two months, I was due to be rehearsing and then touring a new show based on H.P. Lovecraft stories. So I was going to be doing Pickman's Model and the music of Eric Zahn. And if I, I did it last year, I kind of developed it last year, did a couple of nights at Harrogate Theatre. Uh, and I was due to take that on tour. And of course, that tour, I'm looking at the flyer in front of me now, 20 different gigs listed on it, all of which, of course, have been taken away. I'll take that out probably next year now. Um, so Lovecraft, I, I was kind of, you know, I did have half an eye on, you know, developing something for the American market, but whether doing Lovecraft would be in fact just taking, selling sand to the Arabs by taking him to America, not I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, I mean, I, I think we're all looking at what we would have done over the next couple of months and we've had to yeah. change our plans, haven't we? I, everyone I seem to talk to at the moment is doing that, but uh, I mean, this has obviously been a good opportunity to put the stuff online and yeah. maybe attract, your, uh, attract yourself a new audience and I, I know we're, we're appreciative of you uh, you putting that up there because it means we get to to, to watch them and, uh, yeah. and remember, some, remember some of the stories. So what, what will you be doing? Uh, I, I believe some of these are rec they're previously recorded, so what, what are you planning for the you know, the next couple of months, maybe, are you, are you going to be doing any new performances online? Yeah, well, I mean, all, all the ones that I've done in the last three weeks haven't been pre-recorded. Oh, They're okay, all, all right. Yeah. All right, okay, I misunderstood that. But, yeah, so, no, I, so I was the, just... The clip you just played from Casting the Runes, that's a pre-recorded one. Oh, okay. If you go to the section of the YouTube channel called Behind Closed Doors, you'll find um, you'll find all new performances, all fresh. Uh, okay, so... So, all right. yeah, good question. I'm going to... I've got one more week of this, I'm calling the behind closed doors season, um, the first stage of it. Then I'm going to have a couple of weeks off actually preparing the next stage of it. Give myself a little kind of post Easter holiday. <laughs> um, yeah, work on some stuff. So um, I'm going to try and do some stuff for younger listeners as well. I'm, I'm looking perhaps at um, doing a, 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 not a children's novel by Lucy Boston in episodes on the children of green no yes that's a that's a good one i yeah know that one very well so so you've got a you've got a, you've got a lot of things coming up then so and you've got a lot uh -huh. of stuff to keep yeah. you busy Indeed. and that's yeah. that is so thanks for talking to us today uh rob i uh, really do appreciate it and uh we'll make sure we put your uh your links in all our all our stuff so people can find it and be able to uh listen to your uh, renditions or renditions your uh What's, what's yeah, it's yeah. rendition? Would you say? Rendition, I don't know. Good enough for me. Yeah. Re renditions of uh, all your work. So thanks very much. You have a great day. My pleasure. Nice to speak to you.